made it. I have your slides. <laughs> Good. <laughs> well, the weather wasn't as great today, huh? So. <laughs> Oh, right. Uh, too bad. But you made it. Okay. Good. Okay. Welcome back. Welcome to the ISCR membership meeting of this Eurocrypt. The ISCR membership meeting is um, the most important part of the conference, because otherwise um, the conference wouldn't exist if there was not the ISCR. So. I'm going to give you an overview of IACR activities, and we will also have time for uh, open discussion of IACR matters before the RUMP session uh, will start later on. And the logistics of the food, I have to turn over this to Christoph uh, later. Yeah, the membership meeting, here's a brief uh, summary of the agenda. The new things will come and the publications and uh, at the end. The IACR, in case you have not noticed, is the International Association for Crypto Cryptologic Research. It has been founded in 1983 as a tax-exempt non-profit organization in the United States. And with one picture here, we have tried to put everything on this one slide and had to rename some of the things for this year. Generally on those slides, if you've come to uh, more, more of those meetings in the past, you can do a differential um, attack in the sense of most of the things that's read, that's changed from last time, okay? So in particular, we now have, so we used to call crypto, Eurocrypt, AsiaCrypt conferences and Chess FSC, PKC and uh, TCC, we used to call them workshops. And if you've paid attention earlier this year, then we call them now area conferences and the uh, crypto Eurocrypts we call them general conferences, yeah? Because some of those conferences have workshops of themselves, yeah? <laughs> and uh, some of them have several hundred participants, so it made sense to have different terminology. And the other thing is the proceedings, um, so the FSC conference will start, or has started, is starting the transactions on symmetric cryptology. We'll talk about this. So, if you attend this conference, you are going to be a member for IACR of IACR in 2017. If you're not yet a member for this year, you can still become one until like September by um, registering and paying the membership fee on the website. Here is the statistics of how the membership has developed over the years. So, there are some bumps depending on where the locations of the major conferences are. And uh, but we are stable around 1,400 to 1,600 members on average. And as I said before, the membership count for 2016 can still grow um, if people want to sign up on the website. Here is a bit of um, demographics. I'm not actually sure how this is uh, derived, but our database system seems to know this. So. <laughs> um, Probably it's by email address, and this means that probably the dot coms are mapped into um, United States. It could also be by the country code, but uh, it makes sense. I mean, all, all that matters here is that uh, we have a global distribution across the all countries, and uh, we are represented in all over the world. There is a board of directors that uh, is responsible for running the IACR. The board of directors contains nine elected directors and four elected officers and appointed directors. These are people who are, for example, organizing conferences or take special functions like communications for the website and so on. Like to, I like everybody who is a member of the board of directors to stand up. Oh, wow, this is very good. <laughs> so we have Martin, the secretary, <laughs> Greg, the treasurer, Josh, David, Bart, and, um, and, and Brian, and, uh, Dav um, and, and Ivan, Nigel Smart, and everybody else who's standing in the back will become a member if they run for election. <laughs> <laughs> so we have an election. It's a, pa it's a democratic system. We will run an election of the director uh, positions 
of three director positions every year, and we also run an election every three years of officer positions. This year happens to be one of those bigger elections, so um, officers will be re-elected as well, or elected uh, newly. There is an election committee starting to work, get in touch with any member of the board if you are interested in serving on the board so that we can find a proper place for you on the, on the election ballot, yeah, on the candidates list. The elections will be done online with the email address that you have registered at ISER using the Helios voting system, as you've probably seen. We published a journal of cryptology. The editor-in-chief is Evan Damgard. You are no longer getting that journal of cryptology on paper unless you opt in and you pay extra $20 on the website. And this you can do when you register for the conference for the first time in a calendar year. We publish, ah, before we continue publishing the journal of cryptology, we also need a new editor-in-chief because even Damgard is retiring from this position at the end of the year and uh, a search committee has been formed with the members up here and we will, uh, we will organize and orchestrate this search throughout uh, this year so that we can uh, ensure the transition of the Journal of Cryptology. Definitely, if you know about some uh, good candidates, come talk to us, yeah. The proceedings is what collects conference uh, results. We have so far published in LNCS with Springer. There is now a change in this because we are moving the proceedings of FSE away into a newly formed transaction zone symmetric cryptology. I'll talk more about this later. The proceedings are accessible on the web, on the Springer library. And uh, they are membership access control for the first three or four years after the conference takes place, and for this you have to go to the ISR website and authenticate with your ISR credential and go to the Springer website for this. Four years after the conference, they turn into open access for everybody, so all the older material is there without uh, the paywall. We are running cryptology schools. We have started this uh, two or three years ago in a sense of a repeating regular program where we have two submission deadlines each year, and we are sponsoring two or three schools on average with amounts of like $5,000 or $8,000 for covering expenses like invited speakers. These are typically um, educational schools, one week long schools where uh, experts in the field teach the students about their particular field of expertise. The next uh, round of proposals for such schools is due uh, mid of the year for, pro for schools that will take place early next year and in, into, the, in 2017, yeah. I'm going to tell you later what are the schools that uh, have already been approved and will take place in 2016, but you can find all this information on the website as well under the URL slash schools. Then we are also running the fellows program. As you've uh, seen last night, the ISCR recognizes outstanding ISCR members for technical and pro professional contributions. And the ISCR 2016 fellows are Ed Dawson, Shai Halevi, Victor Shoup, and Nigel Smart. Congratulations again. <laughs> also this process is run in a yearly cycle, nominations are due by the end of the calendar year, and do I have the committee here? No. The committee will be available, will be announced on the website. Okay, online services, we are running online services on our own website at iacr.org or at also at iea.cr, and uh, here is a, a brief summary of some of those. During the last year, you might have noticed that we have reformed, uh, thanks to the great help of Mike Rosolek, the communications secretary, the news alert system, which is a uh, consolidated news feed where you can select uh, by particular channels what you are going to be interested in. You can uh, go to the website on this isr.org slash news and have a personalized feed. You can also um, connect to those feeds through your favorite channels, such as uh, 
Facebook, Twitter, Weibo, and so, and that's about it, yeah. But the IACR email subscription there is the one that we are using, uh, that you can use with your personal uh, email address that will be sent an email. You can configure it to send email daily or weekly or something like that. Then we have this access to the publications. This is um, the short URL here is the iacr.ia.cr slash pubs. That brings you to this page, but it's also accessible from the website on the publications, where you have the multiple versions of papers that we have, depending on your current uh, location and access credentials, you can go there. And uh, that means you get access to all the IACR-owned publications through this as a member. Yeah, then there is the cryptology ePrint archive on the on the website. There is a list of open positions that is also quite useful to a lot of people in the community. There is a list of events, a calendar of events and uh, workshops, call for papers. There is also a museum of historic papers that uh, is starting to be collected, showing the age of our field, yeah, <laughs> of papers that have uh, are of historic interest and that have not been made available in easy form otherwise, yeah. There is a cryptographic uh, bibliog I said there's a bibliography da database of all the ISR publications, and there is also a mechanism that we have started for members to sign petitions, because cryptology is, again, and, and continues to be a politically interesting subject. That means that from time to time, we, make, uh, we may make a political statement and we do this with a form of a mechanism where members can sign a petition on behalf of the ISCR via the website. There is a cryptology research fund for students which was created uh, in 2014 with a donation from cryptography research and that's now at yeah, Rambas, the company. This money is used for um, sponsoring, primarily sponsoring student attendance at our events in the sense that uh, student speakers get the registration fees waived at all the ISL conferences. And also we're using uh, this to support the schools program. So we are making this available for educational purposes. Oh, there's a cryptology ePrint archive, and here I have something to mention in the sense that, uh, well, the editors have been Sasha and Nigel for, for a longer time now. We can now handle more than a thousand preprints per year. We had one time we had a year to uh, a report 1000 problem. And <laughs> but here is some advice for every one of you who will uh, post papers on this. Um, based on experience, and this is from Nigel and my own and Sasha's experience. If you post a paper or submit a paper, don't just copy and paste the abstract from your source because it will contain LaTeX codes. Yeah? They're not visible, they're not self-contained. Same if you copy and paste your L abstract for from the PDF, these characters like FF and FI will not survive the copy-paste operation. Yeah, And so we would like you to spend some work actually making sure that your abstracts are properly formatted and properly contained, self-contained. And this is also a reason for rejection sometimes. On the other hand, what we have uh, implemented during the last year is that if you are formatting, if you include mathematical things, mathematical statements in LaTeX format, it's actually shown on the browsers through a piece of JavaScript magic in the mathematical form. So the only LaTeX that's allowed there is your math. Uh, the second thing is that uh, the IACR wants you to uh, upload the uh, final versions of your papers to the ePrint archive, for the also for the record. And uh, in the process of collecting the final versions for the conference submissions, we're also asking you to do this. And if you don't do it yourself, then there is a script in the background that will just upload it. Yeah. And of course, if you revise it later, it will not be revised in the ePrint archive. So um, it's good practice that you take care yourself of uploading your papers to the ePrint archive. Okay, financial report, and uh, I've seen that Greg made it, so we can, can hand over the mic microphone to Greg for the finances. I have to find it. Yeah, I think it's here. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, 
two big ones. That's why this is one. <laughs> Perfect. Financial report for last year. Hi, I'm Greg Rose. I'm the treasurer. Um, the summary doesn't seem to change much from year to year, except for when somebody gives us a million dollars. So if there's anybody who wants to see these slides change, it's really easy. Just give us a million bucks. Um, so uh, strong financial position, extremely low overhead. I say that every year. Um, financial support uh, from sponsoring organisations for the conferences this year was, well, last year, was particularly strong. Um, uh, I've got a shout out to the organisers of last year's Eurocrypt in Sofia, um, whose names are escaping me at the moment, but that's because I'm hopeless. Um, they did a fantastic job of getting sponsorships, uh, and, and so our sponsorship income was up a little bit. And attendance at the events was slightly up. Um, so that's the slightly up attendance graphically. Um, as you can see, there's nothing that really stands out as being unusual. Um, attendance at Chez was sort of noticeably up. Attendance at crypto was slightly down. Uh, Asia Crypt was down a little bit. Everything else, that's pretty normal. Um, but it was a 7% increase across the board. So that's good. Uh, profit and loss on the left side, you can see um, the split up of the income. So registrations for conferences and so on. Um, uh, Chairs brings in the most money. That, that's been a pattern for a number of years recently. Uh, Eurocrypt and crypto usually fight it out for second place. Uh, the smaller workshops and um, uh, donations and endowments and, uh, and stuff like that makes up the rest of it. Uh, and a bit of interest income. Um, but I lump the, the interest is relatively negligible uh, except for the endowment. And for that, I lump that into the endowment. Um, our expenses, uh, as you can see, the top pie chart on the right is um, uh, basically almost all of our money goes towards the conferences. No big surprise. Um, we tend not to split that out, particularly partly for accounting reasons and partly because we don't want to point fingers at anybody and say, you know, you made a terrible loss. Uh, particularly because we actually tell them that it's okay to make a loss because they can't necessarily account for exchange rates and things like that. Um, if you take the, the general administration um, and the credit card fees out of that top pie chart because they're such small slivers and you break them up, you get that bank fees are a surprisingly large chunk of our expenses. That's mostly credit card fees. A uh, little tiny bit of legal, a uh, fairly small amount. By the time you've got a pie chart within a pie chart, that, that wedge for secretariat is very small. And last year, as Christian mentioned, we did a bit of work on revamping the website. So we did spend some money on the website that wasn't there last year. Uh, I, I should say not final. We've sent it off to the accountants for their, uh, for their approval, but I haven't got that back yet. Um, funds on deposit. Um, a million dollars from CR, from cryptography research, uh, as of two years ago. Yes, two years ago. Um, so it really came in late in 2014. Um, I'm, I just show that separately. Uh, that's in a, um, uh, a bond fund that generates enough income and enough capital growth that we should be able to fund the student programs and the, the schools and the stipends and the student speakers essentially forever, um, just out of that one fund. Uh, the yellow is the money that wasn't in the fund, that's still in the fund. Um, and the little tiny sliver of red is the net income, which is actually negative. I don't know how to display a negative number in a pie chart. Um, but the point is, it's little, right? It changes very little from year to year. Uh, so we're, we're fine, you know. And as I said, we do tell the chairs it's okay if you make a loss because it could be exchange rates or, or student subsidies or whatever. Um, so that's fine. The, the highlights, I just mentioned the CRI fund and thanks very much again to Paul Kocher and Cryptography Research for that. Um, we do target break even. It's okay to occasionally make a loss. We do keep the, the overhead is very minimal. If you wonder why we're always in Santa Barbara, it's because the Secretariat is the University of California, Santa Barbara, and they charge us essentially, you know, um, peanuts, pocket money to do that for us. 
Um, the treasurer has one job that's in the constitution, and I actually deleted this slide a couple of times in the past, and then realised that no, it's actually in our bylaws. I have to recommend every year what the membership fees for the next year, for the year after next, actually should be. Uh, so my recommendation as treasurer is not to change them. Uh, we're still trying to figure out, you know, having taken the journal out of the membership fees, it used to be all bundled. We're still trying to figure out, you know. Is that going to work? How that's going to work and so on. So my recommendation is not to change anything. $50 for full members, uh, $25 for student members, and um, for the grey hairs in the audience, I'll just mention we now have a lifetime membership. Uh, 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 what's it called? Um, the lifetime membership for old, older professionals. Senior membership, thank you. We have a senior membership. I'm having a senior moment. I, I will qualify in a very short time. Um, any questions on any of that? Happy to answer. No? Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Greg, and uh, thank you in the audience for uh, silently approving with the proposal as well. <laughs> or did anybody want to discuss the membership fee? No, then we leave it like this. In this case, we have to go find our other presentation again. Here we go. Ah, publications. Yes, this is why we are here, why a lot of people are here. Yeah? Open access has been discussed in the last years a lot in the, in the connection with publications. And just to set the stage clear here, I'd like to repeat here what is the forms, what are the forms of open access that we are talking about here. A green open access means that the author can publish their own versions on the website and preprint servers, ePrint uh, archives and so on. And this is what we indeed have for our publications in the LNCS model during the first four years and for the Journal of Cryptology papers. And note that in other fields, sometimes one doesn't have that. And the gold open access is when the publication itself on the main publication, the definitive form, is accessible freely through the internet. And uh, this is the case for all our conference proceedings from four years or more after their publication. And it's also the case for the newly formed transactions on symmetric cryptology. And so I've talked so much about this that I have to come there now and uh, explain to you what this means. So we are moving from away from the proceedings of FSC in LNCS towards a new transactions, IACR transactions on symmetric cryptology. This is connected to the FSC conference in a way that I'm going to explain right now. So the, it's a journal in the sense that it will have a multi-round reviewing process. It's also a conference-related publication because publishing in Transactions on Symmetric Cryptology gives you a mandatory speaking slot at the FSE conference. So in that sense, it's a conference journal hybrid. And there are uh, a few others in computer science of the same kind, in particular the proceedings of the VLDB, which is uh, the one that uh, pioneered this model and Proceedings of uh, Privacy Enhancing Technology Symposium, the POPETS, is another one that many of you might be familiar with. This journal will be published electronically only on a website, I mean, and it was uh, obviously gold open access. And uh, in order to keep the reviewing process uh, stringent enough, it is the case that the submissions can take place throughout the year, but response time is guaranteed according to a strict synchronization schedule. So you can read the details here. There are going to be on the regular operation, in the stable operation mode, there are going to be four submission deadlines per year. They're going to be announced. Um, the first three of them are already announced in the context of the call for papers for FSC. 2017, because this is n in the same form connected to FSC 2017. The decision and the program committee of FSC now, of course, has to work 
throughout the year. The program committee of FSC does not exist anymore also. It's now the editorial board of the transactions of symmetric cryptology. After two months, you get a decision that can be one of four things, either accept, conditional accept with Shepard, a major rev revision, then you have to do resubmit, a new decision will be made, or reject. And then you have to, you cannot submit again. You have to write a new paper, you have to submit a new paper. That means um, the major revision is perhaps the most interesting mechanism in here, in the sense that you have one or two of these submission deadlines or intervals that you can revise your paper and then you must resubmit for it to be considered as a resubmission. And then the editorial board will ensure that it goes back to the same reviewers that originally reviewed it. That will ensure continuity in the reviewing process from which we believe that it will actually solve some problems that exist in today's reviewing system where you send to multiple conferences over time with some, I mean, based on the, the re uh, acceptance rates, it's clear that uh, about 75 or 80 percent of the papers on average, on an average submission sample are rejected and have to go again or somewhere else. That means that these uh, papers have more continuity in the reviewing process. And then papers accepted by the end of January in a particular calendar year will be presented at the FSC conference in the corresponding calendar year and the FSC conference will be in March. Yes, I think that's, yeah, there is more about the mechanics of this, so I mentioned a lot of that. The editorial board is uh, chaired by the co-editors-in-chief, and this is um, Bart Trenel and Maria Naya Plasencia. The online service is provided by the library of uh, Bochum University, and it provides this at no cost to the IACR through a very special setup that we were able to negotiate through Gregor Leander at uh, Bochum University. It will be run on an open source uh, reviewing system and uh, for an, an open source uh, journal publication system. This ensures continuity in the sense that the software is open and we, can, we could also host this somewhere else should this not uh, be able to continue. And of course, it also means that we do not have any uh, significant paid editorial assistance in this process. That's additional work for the authors that who have to um, make sure that they are using uh, strictly the format and uh, adhere to the schedule of this, yeah. So as you can see, the next topic will be the open discussion. So I'd like to open the floor for discussions of this and anything else at this time, yeah. Nigel. <laughs> Well, you can come here. <laughs> uh, I just want to say something about ePrint. Um, uh, as of 2016, you may submit to ePrint and not violate copyright of any paper accepted at an ACM conference. Yay! So ACM CCS papers, your author versions are now fair game to put up on ePrint where they weren't in the past. ACM in the past claimed the copyright from the moment you submitted the paper to the conference and refused to let you put on an ePrint server. Now you can put it on an ePrint server even after it's accepted. So the only one left is IEEE. If there are any IEEE members out there, please complain. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for the clarification. Questions? Discussions? Yes. <laughs> Um, I, would leak, I would leave this decision up to the FSC steering committee and the editors. <laughs> um, I do not think that the editorial board will on purpose delay papers from being accepted that would otherwise have a, a slot. On the other hand, I think that uh, the quality assurance mechanism should be in place to hold papers to the same standards as they were before uh, for, for FSC. Would you, Bart, as the editor, <laughs> or the, uh, make, want to make some comments on this as well? There will be no paper copies, right? It's just electronic, so there is no limit in that respect. It's just for the, the slots in the conference. And we can always have file assessing at FSC if needed, right? 
very good. <laughs> Except if they're all by the same author, right? <laughs> yes. <laughs> so we've been talking about this hybrid model for ever now, and is this considered a trial? Or are we going to leave it up to particular venues? What what happens if this goes well? Right. So this is a very good question. Um, we have uh, tried a couple of times to sort of top down move away from the current model with some proposals towards a conference journal hybrid. Yeah, as you as you remarked, and um, it has been it has not worked out. Yeah, so this is a bottom up, and uh, I think. I'm very grateful to the FSC steering committee, Bart in, in, in person also, who put a lot of work in making this happen now so that we can have a role model that others could follow, yeah? And um, I encourage everybody to think about this if they wanted to have this to happen as well. Maybe people have to see how it works before they're ready to move other th things there. We do not have currently a board opinion on whether this is uh, required to, to go there in a certain number of time, but we are certainly open towards development in this direction, and we will facilitate this in every possible way. I do also think that the mechanics of running um, crypto and Eurocrypt is slightly different from one area conference in a particular domain that occurs once in a year because all the other conference journal hybrids that I am aware of are actually also occurring once in a year also. But I think we are moving in, in small steps now, and that's, that's the good, good news for all those who have wanted to move to it to this, this uh, for a while already. Yes, Jens. So I guess with this, uh, trial with the uh, FSE, uh, we want to see how it goes, and if it's a six, we'll... we'll, we'll <laughs> okay, so it's a... <laughs> sure. Uh, I guess my question is whether there are, I mean, you've sort of sort thought of metrics that you could measure, whether this is a good idea, or if whether it's just kind of going on and feel that in a couple of years you'll say, oh, this this seems good, we'll, we'll go ahead with the other ones or not. Uh, well, metrics will have to be formed in everybody's own... Uh, uh, impression of this and so this is something that I expect uh, to hear feedback from all of you here and from people at FSE and from people who are related to this as well yeah yes <laughs> thank you I just wanted to regarding metrics I wanted to draw the analogy with the multiple streams in the conferences which we agonized over back and forth for five six seven years uh, we asked the chairs to try it out. They didn't try it out. We eventually, the board told the chairs to try it out or else. <laughs> we didn't say what the or else was, but, um, but we forced it to happen. And then uh, in the last election, something like 95% of the members said they liked it. All right, so, so it's not a trial. <laughs> um, it, it's an ev evolution, um, which we're going to try. <laughs> I think whatever metrics they use for TOSC, which is apparently, is that how we pronounce it, TOSC? This TOSC would not apply to any other of the area conferences. Um, uh, the FSC community is particularly different in that there's a large number of them uh, actually measured themselves on journal publications. This goes some way to addressing that. And they actually, uh, and they've always already had a post proceedings. They never had, they weren't, like in the, in the model of the other one. So any metric that you, you chose for TOSC would not be applicable to any other thing. So the idea of choosing a metric would be... It's just, it's just, yeah, if the people are happy, everyone's happy. It'd be happy. What's also clear is that what became clear in our discussions over the last five years on this, and I think it's not been forever, but like five years or so, that uh, the cryptographers were not considering themselves to be the pioneers and just moving like from scratch. Yeah? So there were always people concerned about uh, not uh, doing also what others are doing. Yeah? And in that sense, I think we are moving in a direction as others are moving now as well. Yeah.
other items for discussion, not only the the journal and uh, or TOSC, the TOSC journal, because we can have a discussion about everything. Uh, yes, Evgeny? Come on, come here. <laughs> Are we great? Also, shout. So ETCC uh, essentially after like the suggestion to the board, the board agreed to try this test of time award and I think it was a really good idea. So uh, in my opinion, I think test of time award uh, uh, historically has been proven to be much more meaningful than best paper award. I don't mind best paper awards, but I think it actually could be a good idea to try test of time award so that we see that after the hype is like over five, 10 years, which papers kind of survived and which papers made a difference, I think it actually, it adds a price, and it actually adds a meaningful price, unlike uh, best paper awards, and you know, uh, I think it would be a good idea to try it. Well, thank you for the suggestion, this is a very good idea to introduce a test of time award. I, I think you're suggesting this in particular for the Eurocrypt, Crypto, AsiaCrypt conferences? Yes. yes. That's that's a very good idea, and we will consider this. Yeah. <laughs> well, this would not be eligible. It was not published at the crypto conference, right? <laughs> Well, what, what you're bringing up, of course, is what Yevgeny mentioned. We have a certain age as a field, and if you're very new, you cannot do that. <laughs> but we're mature enough to have something like a 10 years uh, test of time, yeah. Yeah, but I think we can, like, like with so many other things, the PC chairs uh, have many things to do, and if they're not told to do the test of time award, yeah, I think the best paper award has been installed in the sense that there should be one. I think there is not always actually one, but there should be one, yeah? Other ideas? Yes. Similar to the fellows where we have a committee and every year they pick one, two, three papers from the past and years and then at crypto maybe there'd be a ceremony and people would get an award there as opposed to having one at Eurocrypt, one at Asia Crypt, one at crypto. That's a very good discussion. We're starting now. Should there be one uh, test of time for may all of the ISR publications or should there be one from the conference, exactly the same conference 10 years back? So that's uh, there's uh, two different forms already that it could be done. I think we could, uh, we'll have to, uh, to consider this, yeah. So you prefer... <laughs> one overarch, overreaching committee, right. All ISCR, that'll be an interesting uh, discussion again in committee, yeah? <laughs> Including the... <laughs> This is a piece of information in, in CCC. That there, there's also a committee just for this. It, it's not decided by by the, this year's PC. There, there's a, and and it, it's all organized by the steering committee, uh, deciding that it, it's 10 years. For the, steering committee. the steering committee does this. Well, good. Thank you for that input. <laughs> Any other items? Yes. Yeah, yeah, okay, that'll, okay, then we'll go there, okay? <laughs> so, so immediately next will be the rump session. Um, after that will be the next uh, events, okay? <laughs> so, we have cryptology schools, and actually this is the immediately next event in ISCR-sponsored uh, ISCR event, will be the, Bits coin, the Bitcoin School in Greece, as you can see from the URL, blockchain technologies from cryptographic e-cash to modern cryptocurrency very well connecting, and it happens to be a field where I'm working as well, connecting uh, e-cash systems from the 90s and so on to what's happening in uh, today in the cryptocurrency uh, world. Then there is a school on cryptography um, just before Asia Crypt in Vietnam, and there is a school on randomness in cryptography in Barcelona in November. 
there will be also a computational algebraic number theory school in Turkey in September. So these are the schools. Um, most of those things you should find on the website actually also. Then the next conferences is going to go are going to be crypto in Santa Barbara with Brian Lamacchia as uh, general chair. And crypto will be collocated with chess this year. So chess will take place concentrated in the second half of the week and crypto in the first half of the week. Then there's going to be Asia Crypt uh, in Hanoi in December and Eurocrypt next year in Paris. The date is now fixed, 30th of April until May 4th. And there is a website up as of uh, like one week. So you can already um, pencil this into your uh, uh, agendas. There will be Crypto 2017 again in Santa Barbara with a distinguished lecture by Shafi Goldwasser and there will be Asia Crypt 2017 in Hong Kong. All this has already been decided as before this meeting. And here is some new information. Asia Crypt 2018 will be in Tel Aviv in Israel on those dates. Oh, pardon, Asia Crypt, yeah, yeah, okay, that's right, you're right. <laughs> Too many Crypt. <laughs> But it's, it, is, it, is, it is somewhat in Asia, but it's actually Eurocrypt, yeah? <laughs> or Dunkelmann will be organizing this uh, in Tel Aviv. And he has a plan for uh, also bringing FSC to Israel around the same time frame. And then there will be Asia Crypt 2018. Oh, I, I'm, I'm skipping over Crypto 2018 here, but uh, it will be in Santa Barbara, I promise. Um, there will be Asia Crypt 2018 in uh, Brisbane in December with Joseph Pipsik as general chair. And there will be Eurocrypt 2019 in Darmstadt with Mark Fischlin as uh, organizer. And as you see here, we are planning the locations much further out than the program chairs because all those names of program chairs are either not committed or completely unknown yet. And so we'll have to defer these announcements to the websites and uh, online news systems for later. We also have upcoming area conferences. Chess, as I mentioned, is going to be in Santa Barbara, collocated with uh, crypto. TCC 2016B, we had two TCCs this year. One has already taken place in uh, Tel Aviv, and the second one will be in uh, Beijing in uh, November. There is PKC next year in uh, Amsterdam. And I think uh, that's it, right? Well, there is also, I forgot FSC. There is also FSC in Japan next year, but we just talked about FSC so much. <laughs> it's going to be in March uh, 2017 in uh, Japan. And I think this is about the information I have for tonight. And uh, yes. TCC, yes, TCC is going to stay in the November time frame. There are not going to be two TCCs every year from now. Yeah? <laughs> TCC did a shift of time um, by from the early time in the year into November. So the TCC time frame is now around November. Yes. And now I think I'm at the end. And I would like to ask uh, Bertram or um, Christoph for the next steps in the program, because the RUM session might start at some time. <laughs> Hello, thank you. Uh, rum session starts in 15 minutes, so I propose we get all drinks there. Uh, food will be eventually served, and enjoy your time. I'll be back. Come back to you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs>